Hello, this is your host, Todd Lewis, of the Praise of Folly podcast. So, episode three of the historical blackout. The, the text I'm going to read from is too small, even on screen share, so I just won't screen share it. But it's the first chapter of Harry Elmer Barnes' Perpetual War for Perpetual Peace, Revisionism, and the Historical Blackout. So, we are now going for here. Uh Chapter or chapter one of Perpetual War for Perpetual Peace, Revisionism in the Historical Blackout by Harry Elmer Barnes. The revisionist search for truth relative to the cause of the Second World War is a serious, unfortunate, and deplorable. Samuel Flagg Bemis, Journal of Modern History, March 1947. One thing going, one thing ought to be evident to all of us by our victory over Germany and Japan, no matter what our folly in losing the peace. We have at least survived to confront the second, even greater menace of another totalitarian power. Samuel Flagg Bemis, New York Times, October 15, 1950. The folklore of war, of course, begins long before the fighting is done. And by the time the last smoke has drifted away, this folklore has congealed into a truth of Neolithic hardness. Stuart H. Holbrook, Lost Men of American History, page 42. How war has transformed the American dream into a nightmare. The First World War and American intervention therein marked an ominous turning point in the history of the United States and of the world. Those who can remember the good old days before 1914 inevitably look back to those times with a very definite and justifiable feeling of nostalgia. There was no income tax before 1913, and that levied in the early days after the amendment was adopted with little more than nominal. All kinds of taxes were relatively low. We had only a token national debt of around a billion dollars, which could have been paid off in a year without causing even a ripple in nas national finance. The total federal budget in 1913 was around $724,512,000, just about 1% of the present astronomical budget. Ours was a libertarian country in which there was little or no witch hunting and a few of the symptoms and operations of the police state, which have been developed here so drastically during the last decade. Not until our intervention in the First World War had there been sufficient invasions of individual liberties to call forth the formation of special groups and organizations to protect our civil rights. The Supreme Court could still be relied on to uphold the Constitution and safeguard the civil liberties of individual citizens. Libertarianism was also dominant in Western Europe. The Liberal Party governed England from 1905 to 1914. France had risen above the reactionary coup of the Dreyfus Affair had separated church and state, and had seemingly abolished the Third Republic with reasonable permanence on a democratic and liberal basis. Even Hohenzollern Germany enjoyed the usual civil liberties, had strong constitutional restraints on executive tyranny, and had established a workable system of parliamentary government. Experts on the history of Austria-Hungary have been recently proclaiming the life of the dual monarchy after the turn of the century and marked the happiest period in the experience of the peoples encompassed therein. Constitutional government, democracy, and civil liberties prevailed in Italy. Despite the suppression of the liberal revolution of 1905, liberal sentiment was making headway in Tsarist Russia, and there was decent proposal prospect that a constitutional monarchy might be established. Citizen, civilized states expressed abhorrence of dictatorial and brutal policies. Edward VII of England blacklisted Serbia after the court murders of 1903. Enlightened citizens of the Western world were then filled with buoyant hope for a bright future for humanity. It was believed that the theory of progress had been thoroughly vindicated by historical events. Edward Bellamy's Looking Backward, published in 1888, was the prophetic Bible of that era. People were confident that the amazing developments in technology would soon produce abundance, security, and leisure for their multitude. In this optimism in regard to the future, no item was more evident and potent than the assumption that war was an outmoded nightmare. Not only idealism and humanity repudiate war, but Norman Angle and others were assuming, assuring us that war could not be justified, even on the basis of the most sordid material interests. Those who adopted a robust international outlook were devoted friends of peace, and virtually all international movements had as their sole aim the devising and implementing of ways and means to assure permanent peace. Friends of Peace were nowhere isolationist in any literal sense, but they did stoutly uphold the principle of neutrality and sharply criticize provocative meddling in every political dogfight in the most remote reaches of the planet. 
In our own country, the traditional American foreign policy of benign neutrality and the wise exhortations of George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, John Quincy Adams, and Henry Clay to avoid entangling alliances and to shun foreign quarrels were still accorded respect in the highest councils of state. Unfortunately, there are relatively few persons today who can recall these happy times. In his devastating prophetic book, 1984, George Elwell points out that one reason why it is possible for those in authority to maintain the barbarities of the police state is that nobody is able to recall the many blessings of the period which preceded that type of society. In a general way, this is also true of the peoples of the Western world today. The great majority of them have known only a world ravaged by war, depressions, international intrigues, and meddling vast debts and crushing taxation, the encroachments of the police state, and the control of public opinion and government by ruthless and irresponsible propaganda. A major reason why there is no revolt against such a state of society as that in which we are living today is that many have come to accept it as a normal matter of course, having known nothing else during their lifetimes. A significant and illuminating report on this situation came to me recently in a letter from one of the most distinguished social scientists in the country and a resolute revisionist. He wrote, I am devoting my seminar this quarter to the subject of American foreign policy since 1933. The effect upon a Roosevelt Brad generation is startling. Indeed, even able and mature students react to elementary facts like children who have just been told that there is or was no Santa Claus. There was also an interesting reflection on the teaching of history today. The members of the seminar were graduate students, nearly all of whom had taken courses in recent American and European history, which covered in some detail the diplomacy of Europe and the United States during the last 20 years. A friend who had read the preceding material suggested that laboring men would be likely to give me a horse laugh. That some would is no doubt true, but the essential issue would be the validity of the grounds for doing so. Being a student of the history of the labor problems, I am aware of my gains for labor since 1914. I can well remember when the working day was 10 hours long and the pay was $150. Or fifties, But I can also remember when a good steak cost 15 cents a pound and the best whiskey 85 cents a quart. Moreover, the father, even if he carried only $1.50 a day, had every assurance that he could raise his family with his sons free from the shadow of the draft and the butchery on behalf of politicians. The threat of war did not hang over him. There are some forms of tyranny worse than that of arbitrary boss in a non-union shop. Finally, when one considers the increased cost of living and the burden of taxation, it is doubtful if a man who earns $8 a day now is any better off materially than his father or grandfather who earned $1.50 in 1900. For the sad state of the world today, the entry of the United States into two world wars has played a larger role than any other single factor. Some might attribute the admittedly unhappy conditions of our time to other items and influences than world wars and our intervention in them. No such explanation can be sustained. Indeed, but for our entry into the two world wars, we should be living a far better manner than we did before 1914. The advances in technology since that time have brought the automobile into universal use, have given us good roads, and have produced the airplane, radio, moving pictures, television, electric lighting, and refrigeration, and numerous other revolutionary contributions to hum human service, happiness, and comforts. If all this had been combined with the freedom, absence of high taxation, minimum indebtedness, low armament expenditures, and Pacific outlook of pre-1914 times, the people of the United States might right now be living in a utopian security and abundance. A radio commentator recently pointed out that one great advantage we have today over 1900 is that death from disease has been reduced and life expectancy consistently increased. But this suggests the query as to whether there is any real gain in the light of present world conditions. Is it any advantage to live longer in a world of thought policing, economic austerity, crushing taxation, inflation, and perpetual warmongering and wars? The rise and influence of communism, military state capitalism, the police state, and the impending doom of civilization have been the penalty exacted for our meddling abroad in situations which did not materially affect either our security or our prestige. Our national security was not even remotely threatened in the case of either world war. There was no clear moral issue impelling us to intervene in either world conflict. The level of civilization was lower rather than elevated by our intervention. While the first world war headed the United States and the world towards international disaster, the second world war was an even more calamitous turning point in the history of mankind. 
It may indeed have brought us and the whole world into the terminal episode of human experience. It certainly marked the transition from social optimism and technological rationalism into the 1984 pattern of life in which aggressive international policies and war scares have become the guiding factor not only in world affairs, but also in the domestic, political, and economic strategy of every leading country of the world. The police state has emerged as the dominant political pattern of the times, and the military state capitalism is engulfing both democracy and liberty in countries which have not succumbed to communism. The, matter, the manner and extent to which American culture has been impaired and our well-being undermined by our entry into two world wars has been, brilliant, has been brilliantly and succinctly stated by Professor Mario A. Pei, of Columbia University in an article on The America We Lost, the Saturday Evening Post, May 3rd, 1952, and has been developed more at length by Garrett Garrett in his trenchant book, The People's Pottage. Perhaps by the mid-century, all this is now water under the bridge, and little can be done about it. But we can surely learn how we got into this unhappy condition of life and society, at least until the police state system continues its rapid development sufficiently to obliterate all that remains of integrity and accuracy in historical writing and political reporting. Two, revisionism after two world wars. The readjustment of historical writing to historical fact relative to the background and causes of the first world war, what is properly known in the historical craft as revisionism, was the most important development in historiography during the decade of the 1920s. While these historians at all receptive to the facts admitted that revisionists readily won out in the conflict with the previously accepted wartime lore. Many of the traditionalists in the profession remain true to the mythology of the war decade. Not so long ago, one of the most eminent and revered of our professional historians and a man who had taken, who took a leading part in his historical propaganda during the first world war wrote that American historians had no reason to feel ashamed of their writings and operations in that period. That they had plenty to be ashamed of was re revealed by C. Hartley Garton in his article on The Historians Cut Loose in the American Mercury, reprinted in the form originally submitted to Mr. Mencken in my In Quest of Truth and Justice, and by Chapter 11 of my History of Historical Writing. In any event, the revisionist controversy was the outstanding intellectual adventure in the historical field in the 20th century down to Pearl Harbor. Revisionism, when applied to the First World War, showed that the actual causes and merits of that conflict were very close to the reverse of the picture presented in the political propaganda and historical writings of the war decade. Revisionism would also produce similar results with respect to the Second World War if it were allowed to develop unimpaired, but a determined effort is being made to stifle or silence rev revelations which would establish the truth with regard to the causes and issues of the late world conflict. While the wartime mythology endured for years after 1918, nevertheless, leading editors and publishers soon began to crave non-contribution or to crave contributions which set forth the facts with respect to the responsibility for the outbreak of war in 1914. Our entry into the war and the basic issues involved in this great conflict, Sidney B. Fay began to publish his revolutionary articles on the background of the First World War in the American Historical Review in July 1920. My own efforts along the same line began in the New Republic, The Nation, the New York Times Current History Magazine, and the Christian Century in 1924 and 1925. Without exception, the requests for my publications came from the editors of these periodicals. And these requests were ardent and urgent. I had no difficulty whatever in securing the publication of my Genesis of the World, of the World War in 1926. And the publisher thereof subsequently brought forth a veritable library of illuminating revisionist literature by 1928 when Fay's Origins of the World War was published almost everyone except the diehards and bitter enders in the historical profession had come to accept revisionism and even the general public had begun to think straight in the premises quite a different situation faces the rise of any substantial revisionism after the second world war the question of war responsibility in relation to 1913 and 1939 and 1941 is taken for granted. It's completely and forever settled. It is widely held that there can be no controversy this time, since it is admitted by all reasonable persons that Hitler was a dangerous neurotic who, was, who with supreme folly launched a war when he had everything to gain by peace. It is assumed that this takes care of the European aspects of the war guilt controversy. With respect to the Far East, this is supposed to be settled with equal finality by asking the question, Japan attacked us, didn't she? 
about as frequent as either of these ways of settling responsibility for 1939 or 1941 is a vague but highly dogmatic statement that we had to fight. This judgment is usually rendered as a sort of ineffable categorical imperative, which requires no further explanation. But some of us, some who were pressed for an explanation, will allege that we had to fight to save the world from domination by Hitler. Forgetting General George C. Marshall's report that Hitler, far from having any plan for world domination, did not even have any well-worked-out plan for collaborating with his Axis allies in limited wars to say nothing of the gigantic task of conquering Russia. Shortly after June 22, 1941, nearly six months before Pearl Harbor, there was no further need to fear any world conquest by Hitler. Actually, if historians have any professional self-respect and feel impelled to take the cognizance of facts, there is far greater need for a robust and aggressive campaign of revisionism after the Second World War than there was in the years following 1918. The current semantic folklore about the responsibility for the Second World War, which is, accept which is accepted not only by the public, but also by most historians, is far wider of the truth than even the most fantastic historical mythology which was produced after 1914. And the practical need for revisionism is even greater now than it was in the decades of the 1920s. The mythology which followed the outbreak of war in 1914 helped to produce the Treaty of Versailles and the Second World War. If world policy cannot be, re cannot be divorced from the mythology of the 1940s, a Third World War is inevitable, and its impact will be many times more horrible and devastating than that of the Second. The lessons learned from the Nuremberg and Tokyo trials have made it certain that the Third World War will be waged with unprecedented savagery. Vigorous as was the resistance of many, including powerful vested historical interests to the revisionism of the 1920s, it was as nothing compared to that which has been organized to frustrate and smother the truth relative to the Second World War. Revisionists in the 1920s only risked a brisk controversy. Those of today place in jeopardy both their professional reputation and their very livelihood at the hands of the Smearbund. History has been the chief intellectual casualty of the Second World War and the Cold War which followed. In many essential features, the United States has moved along into the 1984 pattern of intellectual life. But there is one important and depressing difference. In 1984, Mr. Orwell showed that historians in that regime have to be hired by the government and forced to falsify facts. In this country today, and it is also true of most other nations, many professional historians gladly falsify history quite voluntarily and with no direct cost to the government. The ultimate and indirect cost may, of course, be potent contribution to incalculable calamity. It may be said with great restraint that never since the Middle Ages have there been so many peaceful, for powerful forces organized and alerted against the assertion and acceptance of historical truth as are active today to prevent the facts and the responsibility for the Second World War and its results from being made generally accessible to the American public. Even the great Rockefeller Foundation frankly admits the subsidizing of historians to anticipate and frustrate the development of any neo-revisionism in our time. And the only difference between this foundation and several others is that it has been more candid and forthright about its policies. The Sloan Foundation later supplemented this Rockefeller grant. Charles Austin Beard summarized the implications of such efforts with characteristic vigor. The Rockefeller Foundation and the Council on Foreign Relations intend to prevent, if they can, a repetition of what they call in the vernacular the debunking journalistic campaign following World War I. Translated into precise English, this means that the Foundation and the Council do not want journalists or any other persons to examine too closely and criticize too freely the official propaganda and official statements relative to our basic aims and activities during World War II. In short, they hope that, among other things, the policies and measures of Franklin D. Roosevelt will escape the coming years the critical analysis, evaluation, and exposition that befell the policies and measures of Woodrow Wilson and the Entente allies after World War I. As is the case with nearly all book publishers and periodicals, the resources of the great majority of the foundations are available only to scholars and writers who seek to perpetrate wartime legends and oppose revisionism. A good illustration is afforded by my experience with the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, which helped to subsidize the book by Professor Langer and Gleason. I mentioned this fact in the first edition of my brochure on the court historians versus revisionism. Thereupon, I received a courteous letter from Mr. Alfred J. Zercher, director of the Sloan Foundation, 
assuring me that the Sloan Foundation was to be absolutely impartial and to support historical scholarship on both sides of the aisle. He wrote in part about the last thing we wish to do is to check and frustrate any sort of historical scholarship since we believe that the more points of view brought to bear by disciplined scholars upon the war or any other historical event is in the public interest and should be encouraged. In the light of this statement, I decided to take Mr. Zercher at his word. I had projected and encouraged a study of the foreign policy of President Hoover which appeared to me a very important and much needed enterprise since it was during his administration that our foreign policy had last been conducted in behalf of peace and in the true public interest of the United States, rather than on the behalf of some party, political party, foreign government, or dubious ideology. One of the most competent of American specialists in diplomatic history had consented to undertake the project, and he was a man not previously identified in any way with revisionist writing. My request was for exactly one thirtieth of the grant allotted for the Langer Gleason book. The application was turned down by Mr. Zercher with the summary statement, I regret that we are unable to supply funds which you request for Professor Blank's study. He even discouraged my suggestion that he discuss the idea in a brief conference with Professor in question. A state of abject terror and intimidation exists among the majority of professional American historians whose views accord with the facts on the question of responsibility for the Second World War. Several leading historians and publicists who have read my brochure on the struggle against the historical blackout have written me stating that on the basis of their own personal experience, it is an understatement of the facts, yet the majority of these historians to whom it has been sent privately have feared even to acknowledge that they have received it only or possess it. Only a handful have dared to express approval and encouragement. It is no exaggeration to say that the American smear bun operating through newspaper editors and columnists, hatchet men, book reviewers, radio commentators, pressure groups, intrigue, and espionage, and academic pressures and fears has accomplished about as much in the way of intimidating honest intellectuals in this country as Hitler, Goebbels, Himmler, the Gestapo, in concentration camps were able to do in Nazi Germany. The mental stalemate produced by this state of mind is well illustrated by the Professor Fred Harvey Harrington of Professor Charles C. Tansel's book, Backdoor to War, in the Political Science Quarterly, December 1952. Harrington, in private, a moderate revisionist, goes so far as to state there is no documentation for Professor, Professor Tansel's statement that the main objective in American foreign policy since 1900 has been the preservation of the British Empire. This may be compared with the appraisal of the book by a resolute and unafraid revisionist, the eminent scholar Professor George Lundberg, who in a review in Social Forces, April 1953, said with regard to the above contention by Tansel, this thesis is documented to the hilt in almost 700 large pages. Moreover, the gullibility of many educated Americans has been noted as the mendacity of the educators. In communist Russia and Nazi Germany, as well as fascist Italy and in China, the tyrannical rulers found it necessary to suppress all opposition thought in order to induce the majority of the people to accept the material fed them by official propaganda. But in the United States, with almost complete freedom of the press, speech and information down to the end of 1941, great numbers of Americans followed the official propaganda line with no compulsion whatever. This is a remarkable and ominous contrast, especially significant because it has been the educated element which has been most gullible in accepting official mythology taking the population as a whole, and this situation has continued since 1945. Though, of course, the public has been less able to get the truth from the avenues of information since VJ Day than it was before Pearl Harbor. The operation, the opposition to revisionism, that is to truth in the premises, stems from the emo emotional fixation on the mythology built up after 1937, and in part from personal loyalty to President Roosevelt, and the naturally resulting desire to preserve the impeccability of the Roosevelt legend. In regard to the latter, the Roosevelt adulators are much more solicitous about defending their late chief's foreign policy than they are in upholding the infallibility of his much more credible domestic program. There is, of course, a powerful vested political interest in perpetuating that the accepted mythology about the causes, issues, and results of the Second World War for much of the public policy of the victorious United Nations since 1945 can only make sense and be justified on the basis of this mythology. In the United States, it was made the ideological basis 
of the political strategy of the Democratic Party and the main political instrument by which it maintained itself in power after until 1953. It has also been accepted by many outstanding leaders of the opposition party. It has been indispensable in arousing support for their economic policies, which have been used to ward off depression with its probably disastrous political reverberations. The eminent railroad executive and astute commentator on world affairs, Robert R. Young, has stated the facts here with realistic charity in the Commercial and Financial Chronicle. The clash between foreign policy, which makes sense to Americans, and a foreign policy, which makes sense to those who seek to perpetuate, perpetuate political office, patronage, or prominence, is one which only will be resolved by prohibiting, prohibiting re-election. We are very naive when we describe American foreign policy of recent years as stupid. Indeed, that foreign policy has accomplished its object, for it has kept in power, patronage, and prominence, election after election, those who conceived and facilitated it. Powerful pressure groups have found the mythology helpful in diverting attention from their own role in national and world calamity. In addition to the opposition of public groups to the truth about the responsibility for the Second World War, many historians and other social scientists have a strong professional and personal interest in perpetuating the pre-war and wartime mythology. One reason why numerous historians oppose the truth relative to responsibility for the First World War and the main issues therein was that so many of them had taken an active part in spreading the wartime propaganda and had also worked for Colonel House's committee in pre preparing material for the peacemaking. A considerable number of them went to Paris with the President Wilson on his ill-fated adventure. Naturally, they were loth to admit that the enterprise in which they had played so prominent a part had proved to be both a fraud and a failure. Today, the situation has been multiplied manyfold. Historians and other social scientists veritably swarm into the various wartime office agencies after 1941, especially the Office of War Information and the Office of Strategic Services. They were intimately associated with the war effort and <clears throat> with the shaping of public opinion to conform to the thesis of the pure and limpid idealism and ethereal innocence of the United States and our exclusive devotion to self-defense and world betterment through the sword. Hence, the opposition of historians and social scientists to the truth about the responsibility for the Second World War and its obvious results is many times greater than it was in the years following the close of the First World War. Since the war, several core of court historians have volunteered to work to continue the elaboration of official mythology. In addition, the State Department and the Army and the Navy have great swarms of historians dedicated to presenting history as their employers wish it to be written. And at the present time, there is a new influx of American historians and social scientists into our ministry of truth. Two difficulties in pursuing revisionist material. Some might sense this is a seeming inconsistency between the statement that there has been an attempt to black out revisionism after the Second World War and the unfa undoubted fact that important revisionist books... Oh, I skipped it. Three, how the historical blackout operates. The methods followed by the various groups interested in blacking out the truth about world affairs since 1932 are numerous and ingenious. But aside from subterranean persecution of individuals, they fall mainly into the following patterns or categories. Excluding scholars suspected of revisionist views from access to public documents, which are freely open to court historians and other apologists for the foreign policy of President Roosevelt. Two, intimidating publishers of books and periodicals so that even those who might wish to publish books and articles setting forth a revisionist point of view do not dare to do so. Three, ignoring or obscuring published material which embodies revisionist facts and arguments. And four, smearing revisionist authors in their booklets. One, denying access to public documents. There is a determined effort to block those suspected of seeking the truth from having access to official documents and others than those which have become public property. The outstanding official and court historians, such as Samuel Elliott Morrison, William L. Langer, Herbert Feist, and the like are given free access to the official archives. Only such things as the most extreme top secrets, like the so-called Kent documents, and President Roosevelt's communications with George VI, carefully guarded at Hyde Park, are denied to them. Otherwise, they have freedom of access to official documents and the impartial private diaries of leading public officials. Many of these important sources are, however, completely sealed off from any historian who is suspected of desiring to ascertain the full and unbiased truth with respect to American foreign policy since 1933. 
the man who was probably the outstanding scholarly authority on American diplomatic history found himself barred from many of these more important documents. Moreover, many of the notes which he had taken down from the documents he had been permitted to examine were later confiscated by State Department officials. If the complete official documents would support the generally accepted views with respect to the causes and issues of the war, they would seem to be no reasonable objection to allowing any reputable historian to have free and unimpeded access to such materials, as Charles Austin Beer concisely stated the matter. Official archives must be open to all citizens on equal terms with special privileges for none. Inquiries must be wide and deep as well as uncensored, and the competition of ideas in the form of public opinion must be free from public interest or restraint. The importance of freedom of the archives to writers of sound historical material has also been commented upon by the editor of the London Times Literary Supplement of April the 18th, 1952. In relation to the appearance of Professor William L. Langer and S. E. Gleason's The Struggle Against Isolation, 1937 to 1940, which was produced by the Rockefeller Foundation, subsidiary mentioned above. Once the principle is accepted that governments grant access to their archives to certain chosen historians and refuse it to others, it would be unrealistic to ignore the temptation that may arise in the future to let the choice fall on historians who are most likely to share the official view of the moment and to yield readily to discreet official promptings as to what is suitable and what is unsuitable for publication. When this happens, the last barrier on the road to official history has fallen, or will have fallen, to difficulties in publishing revisionist materials. Some might sense there is a seeming inconsistency between the statement that there have been an attempt to black out revisionism after the Second World War and the undoubted fact that important revisionist books have appeared sooner and in greater numbers since the Second World War than they did after 1918. This gratifying situation in no way contradicts what has been said above relative to the far more rigorous opposition to revisionism since 1945. Nearly all publishers were happy to publish revisionist volumes after 1918, or at least after 1923, but not a single major publisher has issued a revisionist book since 1945. Neither is there any evidence that one will do so for years to come. Had not Charles Austin Beard possessed a devoted friend in Eugene David, son of the Yale University Press, and had not the firms of Henry Regency and Devin Adair have been in existence, it is very likely that not one revisionist book would have come from the press following VJ Day. For not only are historians who seek to establish the truth prevented from getting much of the material which they need, they also find it very difficult to secure the publication of books embodying such truth as they have been able to assemble from the available documents. It would be it would naturally be assumed that the first book to give the full inside information on the attack at Pearl Harbor would have been an exciting publishing literary venture and that the manuscript would have been eagerly sought after by any and all book publishing firms. Such, however, was far from the facts. After canvassing the publishing opportunities, George Morgenstern founded the Devin Adair Company was the only one which had the courage to bring out his brilliant book, Pearl Harbor, The Story of the Secret War in 1947. Charles Austin Beard informed me that he was so convinced that none of his former commercial publishers would print his critical account of the Roosevelt foreign policy that he did not regard it as even worth will, worthwhile to inquire. He was fortunate enough to have it, a courageous friend who has heard of one of the most important university presses in the country. The fourth important revisionist book to push its way through the blackout was William, Harry, William Henry Chamberlain's America's Second Crusade. The history of the publication difficulties in connection with the book showed that in the publishing world, there was no more inclination in 1950 than there had previously to welcome the truth with respect to President Roosevelt's foreign policy in the Second World War. Chamberlain is a distinguished author. He has written many important books, and they have been published by leading publishing houses, but none of his former commercial publishers was interested in the manuscript, though it is probably the most timely and important work Chamberlain has written. The head of one large publishing house himself, a noted publicist, declared his deep personal interest in the book, but stated that he did not feel it ethical to jeopardize the financial interests of his company through risking retaliation from the blackout contingent. Two university presses turned down the manuscript, though in each case, the director attested to the great merit of the book. That it was finally bought out was due to the courage and public of Henry Regency, 
who has published more realistic books relative to the Second World War than all other American publishers combined. Yet Chamberlain's work is neither sensational nor extreme. It is no more than an honest and accurately restrained statement of the facts that every American citizen needs to have at hand if we are to avoid involvement in a devastating fatal third crusade. A fifth revisionist book designed for war by an eminent New York attorney and expert on international law, Frederick R. Sanborn, appeared early in 1951. It was published by the Devon Adair Company, which brought out Mr. Morgenstern's volume. The second and definite revisionist volume, Professor Charles K. Lynn Tansel's Backdoor to War, the, for the Roosevelt Foreign Policy, 1933-41, to 41, was published by Regnery. Professor Tansel's previous publishers were not interested in the book. In an entrenching article on a case history in book publishing in the American Quarterly, winter 1949, the distinguished university professor W.T. Couch tells of the difficulties met with the met with in inducing commercial publishers to print revisionist books. And he goes into detail about the problems encountered in securing a publisher for a Frank Reels, a Frank Reels courageous book, the case of General Yamashita. As a matter of fact, only two small publishing houses in the United States, the Henry Regnery Company and the Devin Adair Company have shown any consistent willingness to publish books which frankly aim to tell the truth with respect to the causes and issues of the Second World War. Leading members of two of the largest publishing houses in the country have told me that whatever their personal wishes in the circumstances, they would not feel it ethical to endanger their business and the property rights of their stockholders by publishing critical books relative to American foreign policy since 1933. And there is good reason for this hesitancy. The book clubs and the main sales outlets for books are controlled by powerful pressure groups, which are opposed to truth on such matters. These outlets not only refuse to mark critical, market critical books in this field, but also threaten to boycott other books by those publishers who defy the blackout ultimatum. When such critical books do get into bookstores, the sales department frequently refuses to display or promote them. Uh, let's see. It required the personal intervention of the head of America's largest retail store to ensure that one of the leading critical volumes was displayed upon the count counter of the book department on the store. In the American Legion Monthly, February 1951, Irene Kuhn revealed the efforts of many bookstores to discourage the buying of books critical of administrative administration foreign policy. A striking example of how Blackout pressures are able to discourage the sale of revisionist books in the experience of Macy's in New York City with the Chamberlain book. Macy ordered 50 copies and returned 40 as unsold. If the book could have been distributed on its merits, Macy's could have sold several thousand copies. Not only are private sales discouraged, but equally so are sales to libraries. Mr. Regnery discovered that six months after its publication, there was not one copy of the Chamberlain book in any of the 45 branches of the New York City Public Library. Another sampling study of the situation in libraries throughout the country showed that the same situation prevailed in most of the nation's libraries, not only in respect to the Chamberlain book, but also in the case of other revisionist volumes like John T. Flynn's The Roosevelt Myth. Some of the reasons for this are ex explained by Oliver Carlson in an article on Slanted Guide to Library Selections in the Freeman January the 14th, 1952. As an example, the most influential librarian in the United States has described George Orwell's 1984 as paranoia in literature. The attempt to suppress or exclude revisionist materials from publication extends beyond the book publishing trade. Whereas in the 1920s and early 1930s, all of the most important periodicals were eager to publish content revisionist, competent revisionist articles by rep reputable scholars, no leading American magazine today will bring out a frank revisionist article, no matter what the professional distinction of the author. Most of them, indeed, even refuse to review revisionist books. The Progressive has been the only American periodical which has, with fair consistency, kept its columns open to such material, and its circulation is very limited. While the periodicals are close to neo-revisionist materials, they are, of course, wide open and eager for anything which continues the wartime mythology. If the authors of such mythology do not feel reasonably assured that answers to their articles could not be published, it is unlikely they would risk printing such amazing whitewash as that by General Sherman Miles on Pearl Harbor and Retrospect in the Atlantic Monthly, July 1948. In Admiral Samuel Elliott Morrison's vehement attack on Charles Austin Beard in the August 1948 issue of the same magazine. 
Now, Admiral Morrison is an able historian of nautical matters and a charming man personally, but his pretensions that anything like objectivity and weighing responsibility for the Second World War can hardly be sustained. In his foreword to Morrison's Battle on the Atlantic, the late James Forrestal let the cat out of the bag. He revealed that as early as 1942, Morrison had suggested to President Roosevelt that the right kind of history of naval operations during the war should be written and modestly offered his services to do the job so as to reflect proper credit upon the administration. Roosevelt and Secretary Knox hardly agreed to this proposition, and Morrison was given a commission as captain in the Naval Reserve to write the official history of naval operations in the Second World War. If Roosevelt and Knox were alive today, they would have no reason to regret their choice of a historian. But as a court historian and a hired man, however, able of Roosevelt and Knox, Admiral Morrison's qualifications to take a bow to Von Ranke and pass stern judgment on the work of Beard, whom no administration or party was ever able to buy, are not convincing. President Truman's announcement in the newspapers on January the 14th, 1951, indicate that Morrison's services have been recognized and that he is apparently to be the court historian in chief during the opening phases of our official entry into the 1984 system. But Morrison's various attacks on Beard were handled with appropriate severity by Professor Howard K. Beale in his address before the American Historical Association on December the 28th, 1952, published in the August 1953 issue of the Pacific Historical Review. Another example of the accessibility of our leading periodicals to anti-revisionist materials was the publication of many articles smearing the reputation of Beard. At the time of his death, some of the most bitter articles appearing in journals that had earlier regarded Beard as one of the most distinguished and highly welcomed contributors. Equally illustrative of the tendency to welcome any defense of the traditional mythology and exclude contrary opinion was the publication of the somewhat irresponsible article by Arthur M. Schlesinger Jr. on Roosevelt and his detractors in the June 1950 issue of Harper's Magazine. It was obviously proper for the editor to publish this article, but not equally defensible was his inability to find space for the publication of an answer even by one of the outstanding contributors to Harper's. Most of the professional historians' ma historical magazines are so completely close to the truth concerning the responsibility for and merits of the Second World War as are the popular periodicals, likewise questioning the traditional mythology about the causes and results of this war. The aversion of the New York Times to the truth about Pearl Harbor 10 years later is dealt with below. All right, everyone, at this point, I will cease reading. I will check the comments now. We have Refined Canine, hello. Corbin, hello. Connor Rafferty, National Populist, hello. Uh, let's say record deepness. Few U.S. generals have done more damage to their country than George C. Marshall on and off the battlefield. Yes. Record deepness. Herbert Hoover went on to write a revisionist history of his own, Freedom Betrayed. Excellent book. I read that like 10 years, 13 years ago. The book was, that wasn't published until 2011, so the blackout indeed goes on. Yep. Uh, GF, imagine the system collapses and we don't have access to today's documents, write history, and the next generation just follow grievances and semi-mythic tales of strength of how they got them. Well, that is definitely the danger, but I guess part of the advantage to the blackout, if there is one, is that the books that were printed still exist in hard copy somewhere. And if they can be found, they can be preserved. They weren't like digitized and then, you know, the original copies, you know, <laughs> so that's the best we got. But uh, thank you, everyone, and we'll tune in next week for part two or part four of the historical blackout, part two of the first chapter of Perpetual War for Perpetual Peace. This is Todd Lewis of the Price of Folly podcast, signing off.